Well, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Dr. Ron Martinez, and welcome to the start of our course, which I'm really very much looking forward to. So today we're introducing the course, and specifically I want to look at what may be some potential barriers to uh, success in academic publishing, um, and there are many of them, but uh, we, can, we can deal with those. And also, uh, what are we going to be looking at in today's course? Uh, just quickly, a little bit about me. Um, I've been involved in the field of applied linguistics uh, since 1992, um, especially uh, in the area of teacher development and um, supporting international scholars in their writing. Um, and a lot of my uh, work is heavily, uh, uh, heavily flavored with uh, vocabulary development and with something called corpus linguistics, which is essentially uh, the use of electronic tools to analyze text, which can come in very handy um, for what you will be doing in this course. And so we'll be looking a little bit about look in using those tools also for you, and hopefully you'll find um, some of that useful. I am faculty both here at UC Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley's college writing program, and also a member of faculty at the Universidade Federal do Paraná, the Federal University of Paraná in Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, where I am also the director of a writing program, a writing center that supports international scholars um, for international, for um, a rather Brazilian scholars for international publication. And so um, I'm very much involved in both supporting uh, authors, um, native speaking authors, but also international authors for whom English is not a first language. I'm also a member of the English Language Specialist Program for the United States Department of State, which occasionally sends me on missions to support um, the internationalization efforts of universities, especially outside the United States. And um, a couple of those initiatives, in my case, uh, involve um, one, um, English as a medium of instruction, so how to, how to help develop uh, professors in different parts of the world. So that they can deliver their their courses uh, through English, uh, but also, and I would say more recently, especially, um, how to develop writing programs in universities that can support scholars in their international internationalization or of their research, or how to disseminate their research more broadly on the global stage. So that's uh, a little bit about me. It's enough about me. I want to know more about you. Um, specifically, I'm wondering why you're here, which might seem a, a bit of an odd question, considering that you are enrolled in this course and you should know, I should know at least as your instructor, that you're here because you want to learn about international publication. But specifically, I want to, I mean, that's an obvious answer, but also I want to know why you're really here. And what I mean by that is what drives you to be here today? Or what, or more broadly, what has driven you or what, what do you think drives you to want to publish in the first place? What is your main motivation? And in reflecting on this question, what drives uh, not only you, but a lot of publishers or a lot of, a lot of scholars to want to publish, you can look back at, um, you can look at two aspects of that answer, which I think one of which is that there's a practical, um, pragmatic answer, which is, okay, I'm, I need to publish because uh, I will not be able to get tenure, or I will not be able to get into get the, uh, the best grants and so on without um, publications in, in top tier journals. That is a reality um, for a lot of us. However, I think that there is another motivation that's perhaps more important, um, and I'll be talking about that in a second. Um, and but both have to do with uh, acceptance, perhaps. On one level, on a more sort of superficial level, we want acceptance of our manuscripts. <laughs> we want uh, a particular chapter or article to be accepted by a journal or a publisher. Uh, perhaps more deeply, we want acceptance um, of not just one manuscript, but um, acceptance by our peers. We want acceptance of our ideas. Um, in either case, uh, it has taken you, I'm sure, a number of hoops to get to this point where you want to publish. And I'd like you to reflect for, we're going to reflect now about 
those hoops that you had to go through, these barriers that you had to go through, and how certain fears can contribute um, negatively to uh, to your productivity as a writer. Um, so take a little trip back in time before you were before you got into college, your first undergraduate uh, program, I'm sure that you felt some anxiety um, of wondering if you were going to get in. This is a kind of your first, maybe your first real fear of rejection um, prior to uh, getting into college. Um, your first fear, your major, major event of fear of rejection in, in higher education. And of course, then you overcome that that fear and you get into you get accepted into whatever university you're accepted into and that's great you think you're over that no more problems you're out you graduate and then you want to get into your ma or phd program probably one that you're involved in right now and then there are the gatekeepers uh the, the gatekeepers um in in this case are the individual institutions and the, the universities these guys here are the gatekeepers, and they are kind of scary. And this can be a very scary, a scary experience for people. But then you overcome that only after you overcome a fear of rejection. But for a lot of people, this fear of rejection of again getting into an MA program or PhD program may be enough for them to not even try. Um, they may feel that oh, uh, I may not. Uh, I, I, the fear of not being accepted is so uh, traumatizing for them that they prefer not even to try, or uh, they fear rejection of a top of getting rejected by their top tier journal choice, their flagship journal of their field, and so they go for something that maybe they feel has a higher chance of not rejecting them. But then, of course, those of you who are taking this course, most of you are in, and that's great. You're happy. Of course, now you have one more barrier in front of you. A lot of you have not published before, and the gatekeepers now are these guys over here, Taylor and Francis and Springer and Wiley and, and Elsevier, of course, and others. Um, and it's a scary thing now because not only will are those guys gatekeeping, but you have a whole... A whole gauntlet of uh, editors and reviewers who are ready just to beat up your your ideas. And at the end of the day, um, this fear of rejection can be very daunting for uh, many scholars who um, may really <clears throat> associate the process of publishing with just uh, horrible negative ideas. And uh, it, this is this is actually quite common. It's normal to feel this kind of fear of rejection. <clears throat> the, but in the end, what you're fearing is not so much perhaps of not getting a manuscript accepted. That is true as well. But that you have something that you say that you believe is important. Often cases, it's um, it's related to. Uh, work that you've done as a graduate student, either a master's student or a, a doctoral student, um, you've dedicated several years of your life to, um, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and to have your ideas not accepted is just something that a lot of people um, fear. And uh, that's normal. It's some, that's, you know, you're talking about something that's very precious to you, you're something that has formed part of your identity. So <clears throat> acceptance on a broader, on a, on a deeper level is not acceptance just of a manuscript. That's important too for you, but acceptance of, of who you are, your ideas, and what, what you have to contribute to your field, to your discipline. You have something that you feel you want to say, that's something that you feel has, is worth saying, and um, you have a particular audience that you want to speak to. And this notion of having a particular audience that you want to address is something that we'll also talk about during this course. And this drives you to be the opportunity, opportunity to be able to speak to your peers. And yes, you want people to know 
your name. <laughs> and that's, that's also a driver. You want people to, to recognize you. you know, they want people to, to cite you. And that's good because you believe in your ideas and you want other people to, to believe them as well. More and more, um, and of uh, relevance to especially you who are taking this course, uh, who is not a native speaker of English, uh, it's of relevance to know that, um, and you certainly do know that um, communication in science, publication, scientific publication, um, academic publication, uh, occurs um, these days mostly through English. And English can seem like this all-consuming, uh, hegemonic uh, monolith that uh, is destroying all other languages in the world. And there are some arguments to be made um, that would suggest that that is the case because 95% of uh, scientific communication these days occurs uh, through English. But it's not just the fact that it's English uh, language. There is, um, there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole game, let's say, that's played, um, and a kind of hegemonic game that's played um, between publishers and authors that uh, is not just in English, uh, but it involves uh, preferences that, that stem from uh, North America and Europe. And, of also, and also of relevance to this course is that um, if, you're, if your first language is not English, it may be a barrier to publication and a danger to think that English is somehow a magic catalyst to getting published. English is inescapable these days. Um, it, in in Brazil, you have uh, English as a preferred language of even Brazilian journals um, since 2014 or even before. And I'm sure that if you are um, taking this course in another from another country, uh, you may find that in your country is a similar experience. And so English is is obviously the language of scientific communication for many disciplines. Um, but it, you have to be careful to think that somehow if you have a really good, really good English in your manuscript, that bippity boppity boo, uh, magically your manuscript is transformed into something that is citable and will cause impact. The one thing doesn't necessarily entail the other. I'm going to talk a little bit about this now. So in the map of the world, if you were to um, change the, the, the proportions of each uh, land mass in accordance with um, how much they publish um, re relative to the rest of the world, this map would become contorted um, and look more like this. And the shape that this takes uh, would, uh, at a glance, seem to suggest that um, there are certain countries that 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 dominate certain regions. Um, quite quite plainly, the the global north versus the global south stands out, and that certainly um, is is true. Certainly, that that is something that that does occur. Here here you see that. Um, Africa has shrunk to basically nothing. South America is quite diminished. And therefore, uh, there, were, there are some that would say, well, here you have um, maybe some kind of correlation between um, English, since over here is English is spoken and over here is English is spoken or is very important. In Scandinavia and and the UK, for example, that it would seem that there is some kind of correlation, perhaps between English and indeed there is, but it goes beyond that. So if you look at um, the the financial contribution 
uh, investment in, in terms of billions of dollars uh, as a percentage of contribution to the to um, research and um, and development, you have um, you have some numbers that stick out here. So you have, for example, very small um, contribution relative to the world from Africa and Central America and South America, for example, just 2.6%, 1%, and so on. But if you compare that, you have North America, that's 27.9%, Europe, 21.6%, and a huge chunk over here um, in East and Southeast Asia of um, a whopping 37.6%. And then you go back to that map and you see that actually there's more going on here. And specifically, you have over here on the right um, another big chunk that's nothing to do with English per se, since it's not the, the main or dominant language of Japan or, or China, for example, and yet it does grow, it, it becomes inflated. And then you see there's some kind of overlap that's not just English, but it's to do with other other um, mechanisms that, uh, as well. And so it's not just language, but also something to do with um, access to research networks. It's access to um, uh, uh, resources, um, even, even reference resources, but also labs and so on, uh, that make, that can make a difference. So, we it's important to to consider um, language um, as not some kind of magic bullet, um, but as uh, something that is part of a melee, a, a part of a of a uh, a, a part of of, of uh, an array of um, factors that can contribute to publication, and I'm I put this in here uh, as an example. So you have in 2020 an article that's been cited nearly a thousand times. Um, this is a, this is a thousand times in um, May of 2020, and uh, and it just came out in March of. 2020, and so you think, wow, that's that's something that's that's really quite an accomplishment to have so many citations in such a short period of time. But what contributed to that is not the fact that it's in English; um, that's one part of it. But it had a lot to do with um, be, it being mentioned in the media, obviously with the backdrop of the global pandemic of uh, 2020, that hydroxychloroquine was something that was discussed a lot. Um, in the media and promoted by um, the United States president and Elon Musk, um, the CEO of Tesla and, and important news personalities like uh, Laura Ingram of Fox News. And so this article, which had a team of authors from France, for whom uh, English is not a first language, they published through English. Yes, that was important. That helped to get the the article noticed, perhaps, because if it had been written in another language, maybe it wouldn't have been noticed as much. But it was all these tweets by investors who mentioned this as a possible treatment and um, important, prominent personalities in the business and uh, science world tweeting about it, and then the president himself tweeting about it, even citing the journal <clears throat> in which that study was uh, that study appears and and on the news and so yes english made a difference but it was it was a lot more than that um an analog to this would be making appearances at conferences um and uh, being invited to speak and uh um perhaps even blogging about it and getting mentioned by others and um a lot of that is facilitated by having being plugged into a network of, of scholars and academic community that be eventually becomes interested in your work and wants to cite it. English per se doesn't necessarily lead to 
um, a, a high impact or, or causing impact. In fact, research research actually shows that somewhere in the region of fifty percent of all um, articles written in English are actually never cited. <laughs> Um, so it's not the fact that they're written in English that leads to their publication um, necessarily or leading them to eventually being even being noticed. Uh, it's uh, actually quite sad that you think that around half of all articles actually don't get noticed um, by anybody. And so it's not just English. All right. So there's something deeper going on here. And I do I do want to address, nonetheless, um, even though English is just a tip of a, a large um, publication iceberg, I do want to address uh, this apprehension that people have. Um, and it, Highland talks about it, and he mentions that, uh, Ken Highland, he mentions that attitudinal or attitude surveys reveal that English as an additional language authors often believe editors um, and referees are prejudiced against them for any non-standard language uses. Okay, so a key word here is often believe, and this belief that that um, that that uh, these uh, uh, editors and and uh, journals and referees are biased against um, authors, I think, is one of the barriers. It can be a potential or contribute to a barrier to to writing, uh, because if you come into the publication process with this belief that uh, because of deficient language, you may you may um, not, not succeed. Uh, that is not a good way to attribute success or, or failure. In fact, as you will see in a few minutes um, later on in this in this module, um, there are other um, factors involved. And uh, and if you attribute success or failure to to language alone, um, that's not very productive because if you believe that. An, uh, an article is being criticized or even rejected due to language, you're not addressing any other possible um, shortcomings um, in your research um, or even in your writing that need to be addressed. Um, so that is a key word here. I, this, this belief um, is, is something that's important. And so I like to look at, okay, that's a belief, but what evidence is there of, of that? Um, I, I do. I am sympathetic. I want to believe uh, that that in them, and I do believe um, that there is some bias. But um, what evidence is there of the kind of prejudice that Highland mentions? Well, this is a debate that goes back some numbers uh, since the, at least the 1990s. But one one debate that stands out for me is the one that was um, touched off by John Flowerdew. Um, of the University of Hong Kong, uh, at the time the University of Leeds, who used Goffman's stigma as a theoretical framework to discuss this problem with the idea that um, once a reviewer perceives that an author is not from an, a center country, so the, the main producers of research, especially the English-speaking producers of, of the world, then that author immediately has a stigma attached to her or his uh, research. And um, I think what John Flowerdew says is, is uh, a, a good example of this kind of argumentation because he says, while it is difficult to find concrete evidence that writers who use English as an additional language are discriminated against in academic publishing, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that to suggest that they may be. So this is a very heavily hedged statement that they may be. And there's no, it's difficult to find any concrete evidence, but there's anecdotal evidence. And those of you in the science world, um, especially not the, the humanities or social sciences may be thinking, well, what good is anecdotal evidence? And I hate to be flippant or dismissive of um, Flowerdew's work, but uh, because uh, he was unable, or was his research was not supported by um, a lot of empirical um, data to 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 back up this this notion that there was stigma, the authors were stigmatized. Then he did touch off quite a debate in the literature, and so his his inability to um, 
provide a lot of direct evidence uh, that there's discrimination doesn't mean there isn't any discrimination or bias against English as an additional language authors. But there's a reason why evidence um, is hard to come by. And it's that, as you'll see in this module, uh, language per se, language alone, never seems to be, or very, very rarely seems to be, the one thing that, con that leads to a rejection. Um, is there evidence, though, for a bias, a native speaker bias, native speaker of English bias? Well, that we do have evidence for. And I know this as a director of a writing center, looking at a, a manuscripts from so many different authors. And when their manuscripts are criticized, often this word uh, native speaker, this term native speaker comes up. Um, what you see is a general pattern of uh, kind of content related commentary um, when manuscripts come back from, from journals for, for uh, the authors to either rewrite or or to correct or whatever, um, the, the, often the comments come back from reviewers with content-related um, uh, comments and also language-related comments. If if the actually for both native and non-native speakers, um, and what happens is is that uh, non-native speakers tend to you know focus on this native speaker. Um, term and think okay, and they, they focus on that a little bit too much. That thinking that okay, I have to fix the English in my manuscript, and not focusing enough perhaps on other elements um, in the manuscript. Whereas native speakers don't really think about the language as much; they focus more on the content areas. However, um, irrespective of whether or not um, native speakers are mentioned, I. I am personally against this idea that somehow uh, native speakers uh, should be asked to, or, or the authors should be asked to look to seek out native speakers to to redress um, language issues in um, their manuscripts, since uh, it's as if uh, the implication is that native any native speaker will do. You can grab some random person on the street at your local Starbucks and say, "Excuse me." Um, are you a native speaker? Good. Can you look at my manuscript? And of course, uh, that just is not the case. And, so, and it also somehow suggests that um, non-native speakers need native speakers to solve their problems. And I don't believe that to be the case either. Okay, so you do see this uh, a lot. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you look carefully at reviewers' comments, you often find that it is likely a non-native speaker, her or himself, who is actually recommending um, seeking out a native speaker. So this is a kind of very odd phrasing. It is valid to make an English writing review with obviously mistakes here, since we are not Eng English native speakers. And uh, we, uh, they, they're uh, often, uh, at least in my experience, the harshest comments about uh, language can come from apparently non-native uh, speaking reviewers. Um, again, you see native speaker here, but what's what's important to point out is that there is one section here, language instruct and structure, but it, there's all this other stuff over here about content. And and so on. Uh, again, comment about native speaker, but also comments about a lot of other issues. So you can say that there is a, a bias in the sense that there is um, there is this uh, some for some reason uh, this this. Uh, preference for native speakers to review manuscripts. Uh, but does that cause rejection? Does the fact that a reviewer notices that there are mistakes or that the language doesn't sound like what a native speaker would produce or whatever, does that recommendation to seek out a native speaker, does that necessarily lead to rejection? And that's another matter altogether. And so Martin Hewings uh, looked at this 
um, he, he looked at um, 228 reviews from the Journal of, of English for Academic Purposes between 1998 and 2004. Uh, and these reviews were conducted by 56 different reviewers. There wasn't much information about who was doing the reviewing, but the 56 different reviewers. And then Martin Hewings organized these manuscripts into type of author, so native and non-native, and then looked at um, how many of these uh, of these manuscripts from each uh, author type uh, were accepted, um, uh, rejected, or um, asked to revise and resubmit. Okay, and here you have uh, the the results of what his analysis was. And the question is, is there um, evidence of, of prejudice here? On the on the face of it, it would look like there is because here you have, on the left-hand side, you have native. And on the right-hand side, you have the non-natives. <clears throat> In this category, um, uh, A, it's the ones, it's A is accept. And here you see, that the native speakers have 27% um, of their manuscripts were accepted versus 10% of the non-natives. <laughs> I don't know what about the statistical significance of this, but then in B, you have rejections, and then you have a higher rate of rejection among the non-native speakers. Oh, I'm sorry, this is B is uh, revise and resubmit, so you have a, a higher number of manuscripts that were asked among the non-native speakers to be worked on and then um, resubmitted. And then in category C, the last one, you have um, apparently far higher percentage of non-native speakers who were rejected. But when Martin Hewings analyzed the reasons for rejection, he founded some very interesting things. So he said that um, it was, first of all, it was not always possible to decide whether a comment was referring to language or content. So there was a mix, as we saw in the earlier examples, of language and content um, issues. So as an example, a reviewer might say, well, it's not clear what you mean by this. It's not, in that sense, uh, that, that statement, it is not clear what the author means by this or that, could ostensibly refer to um, a conceptual element, something to do with um, the content um, per se, uh, or a language element. Maybe the 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 author is not being clear in in the way through which the way that the author is expressing her or himself, or both. And then the uh, the second comment that Martin makes Martin Hewing makes is while uh, the number of comments on language for non-native English speaking authored papers is higher, so the number of comment related uh, number of language-related comments uh, was higher. Native English-speaking authors appeared to attract more criticism. Actually, that's interesting. And then his final statement, I think, is very relevant, which is there is no clear evidence that non-native English-speaking authors are disadvantages, disadvantaged relative to native English-speaking authors because they do not have English as a first language. Instead, he points out that of the 25 reviews that gave a re reason to reject, six or 24% explicitly stated that the papers offered nothing new or of interest to the readership. And a further three said papers, uh, said the papers reported work that was outside the field of ESP. So here you have on the one hand of the 25 reviews for the non-native speakers, 24% said that there wasn't clear or there was nothing new um, to the readership that was not made clear what the what was the novel about the paper. And um, that was a high percentage. And then 12% said that, uh, that they actually had sent the paper to the wrong journal. It wasn't appropriate for the journal. And that, those two statements are actually consistent with uh, other research and my own experience talking to editors uh, about the reasons for rejection. Not to do with language per se, uh, but 
uh, to do with the lack of clear novelty of the of of the research, and basically not being within the 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 purview of the journal. On on the other hand, Martin Hewings found that in the corresponding fifteen reviews of the native authored papers, so British, American, Australian, and so on, um, only two said that they offered nothing new or of interest, and none claimed that they were not ESP related. And so there's something else going on here, um, at least in the in the in the the research that Martin Hewings conducted that goes that lies outside um, English. Um, there's something else happening here. There's a, there's a question that needs to be asked: Why did these non-native English-speaking authors not um, explicitly state, or rather, they did not um, make explicit what was novel about their 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 paper? And why did they, in, apparently, more frequently submit manuscripts that were not of uh, relevance? or outside the field of the journal, which is English as a specific English for specific purposes, ESP. Um, I think there are a number of reasons for that. I won't go into that right now, but for for the purposes of this of this course, what his his final conclusion is, whatever the reasons, they appear to lie outside any difficulties authors may have had in producing written English. And so the barriers to publication for these authors was not English per se; it was something else. And we'll be dealing with these with these something else's um, in this course, right? Part of it is that there is a, a kind of game, uh, which I alluded to earlier in uh, in this module, that is played um, by uh, uh, authors. And journal and journal editors, and it's that there's a certain there are certain rules of engagement, as it were, when it comes to writing and submitting papers that often uh, our authors are not trained in. And this, these these rules of engagement, the, the rules of this game, are often uh, made explicit uh, to to authors in certain regions, and maybe not so much in others. And so Ken Highland. Uh, in 2016, uh, he writes that this is basically the idea that um, there is linguistic injustice is a myth. I think this statement is not really uh, it's it's not really the best way to word uh, his thesis. It's, it's not that linguistic injustice is a myth, but rather it is a a misinterpretation of the phenomenon uh, of rejection. Of non-native speaking authors, vis-à-vis uh, -vis native speaking authors of English, uh, since uh, the attributing rejection to language alone is actually doing these authors an injustice. And Highland says as much. He says, "Look, I am not, of course, claiming peer review to be perfect. There is, however, little evidence to support the idea that there is a widespread and systematic bias against writers." whose first language is not English, right? And he points to other evidence, Highland, and it says that if you look at um, in the year 2000, you look at these six disciplines and their top tier journals, and you break them down and look at the first authors of those articles, and you look at native English speaking authors versus English as an additional language authors, you can see that in many cases, um, except for um, physics uh, and electrical engineering, in, in most cases, uh, you have native English speaking authors as having a higher percentage of representation with an overall higher proportion of 61%. Um, but in 2011, down here, that changes. And you have um, an increase in, in nearly all cases over here of um, authorship. 
you look compared to the column above that, this in 2011, and overall, this changes completely to switch to shift over to a higher proportion of non-native speaking authors in 2011, and this has increased since 2011. So uh, you'll see uh, that in uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, this uh, this will have changed, uh, and and that's good news. So you're seeing more and more um, non-native speaking authors being represented um, in 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 science publishing more. There are many reasons for that. Um, it's not necessarily the fact that they're learning English more, uh, but it had, probably has something more to do with more access to uh, research networks um, and uh, things of, of that nature, um, a, a kind of general upper mobility on the, on the international academic, uh, in the academic stage more than, than English per se. But to the to Highland's point, this evidence um, would suggest that there isn't a systematic bias against them. In fact, there is evidence now that um, there it's become more equitable. And a main a ma important point I'll make now and I'll make again is that there are no native academic writers. You're not born learning, knowing how to write academically. You could argue that there are people who are born poets, um, though I'm not sure that's really the case either, or born lyricists. Um, you don't necessarily have to learn that formally, but um, the academic genre, and especially the research article genre, is one that is a, a convention that is, doesn't come natural to anybody. Um, and for, my, for me, it's something that I learned, but I have an advantage. Um, I, have, I had an, maybe an advantage over many authors. I've always enjoyed writing. So here's a, here's a stretch of text that I wrote um, for a, a manuscript uh, recently and uh, a chapter. And I point out here that there was something here I was not comfortable with in this text here. An official course number was attributed to the course. I didn't like this repetition course and chorus here. I thought it sounded awkward. And I changed it to an official course number was assigned. And I sounded and to me that sounded much more elegant. Seems like a really simple thing. And it is, except that I police myself a lot when I'm writing. I while I write, I I'm reading it out to myself. I'm imagining what this will sound like to the reader after I finish writing a paragraph or the whole text, I go back and I look at what I've written again and again to try to polish it. And that's because I take a lot of pride in my writing. I like the writing process. Um, I'm an experienced writer and I enjoy writing. That's not the case for a lot of you, not a case for probably the majority of writers, uh, rather academ academic uh, uh, authors out there, the ones who feel that they have to write um, for their career. They may not enjoy uh, the process as much as I do. They may not take as much pride in their writing um, as I do. Uh, but I like to think of academic authorship as um, a kind of craft that needs to be honed. It's not something that you're born with. It's something that takes time. And uh, I, I consider my, myself a, a kind of artisan when it comes to, to writing as, as a whole. I enjoy the I enjoy writing and and hopefully one day, if you don't already, you will also see writing as something that is a craft, something that you hone, um, a kind of artisanal process. You'll see this this um, the Sullivan paper again in the next module, but Sullivan uh, conducted some research in two thousand two to look at why uh, manuscripts are rejected by journals or one particular journal in this case. And as you can see here, again, the number one reason was the manuscript was sent to the wrong journal, as uh, Martin Hewing's uh, research also um, suggests. A lack of novelty, number two, and then a number of other things. And then at the end, the number 10, Martin, uh, rather, um, Sullivan points out that poor writing is mentioned as a reason for rejection. 
But it's the clarification of this point that I find interesting for this particular moment in the module, which is, he says, in talking about poor writing, he also talks about good writing. He says that good writing is like art. You know it when you see it, but describing what it makes it good is difficult. A quality paper states its purpose clearly, explains the importance of the topic, describes what happened, and reports the outcome. Such a paper is easy to read, the author's train of thought can be followed, and your questions are answered before, uh, before you think to ask them. So let me stop right there for a second, because I think this is worth breaking down. First of all, uh, this idea that good writing is an art, yes, of course, a lot of people um, think of uh, poetry as, as a kind of art, but very, very uh, few people, I think, think about you know, the, the kind of prose that goes into a, an article on uh, mathematics uh, as art. But what he points out is that uh, it's it's like art, like any art. You know it when you see it, but describing what makes it good can be difficult. But he, he tries, and he says, well, a quality paper, first of all, states its purpose clearly and explains the importance of the topic. And as we saw a little bit earlier um, in the Martin Hewings research, the reasons for rejection was that the reviewers were unable to see why the topic was important. And stating a purpose clearly and making it clear what the importance of the topic is, um, is one uh, rhetorical move that we're going to be talking a lot about, we'll be focusing on in this course because it is so important. A good, good writing is easy to read. This doesn't necessarily mean that the English is correct, but there's something else going on. And what he, what he goes on and he explains this and says that, the author's train of thought can be followed. And so this is also something that will be this I, I, uh, notion of um, how to make your text more fluid and uh, coherent and cohesive um, is important, how to, to make the, your train of thought more easily followed. And then this one here, this last point in the sentence, I think is wonderful that your questions are answered before you think to ask them. So you, the reader, you're you're already raising questions and you probably already do this with manuscripts and, and other literature that you read you know you may be in questioning what the author is, is is talking about and then the author actually addresses your question before you even before you even think to ask it and good writers do this good writers as they're writing they're anticipating possible questions that the that the readers will have and already addresses them uh, and we'll be talking about how to do this in practice in this in this course as well. Then he goes on and says, well, on the other hand, um, on the other hand, uh, manuscripts that lack clarity um, and are poorly organized are rejected out of hand. Grammatical and spelling errors or incorrect pr uh, punctuation uh, in themselves may not be reject reasons for for rejection, but contribute to the decision decision if there are other weaknesses. So those things in themselves, um, I think this is really the the main point, may contribute in themselves will not contribute to rejection, but can, can but maybe uh, or may not rather I should say are grammatical and spelling errors or language mistakes in English or imperfect or non-native English in and of itself uh, is probably not the reason for rejection in, in most cases. But if there are other fragilities, if there are other shortcomings in a manuscript, it may tip the scales. And I think at the end of the day, that's, that's probably what happens. So if you can hone and sculpt a manuscript um, not thinking of uh, grammar necessarily or, or lexical choices alone, but the, the general shape of your text, the general shape that your article will take, that can make a big contribution. If you can see yourself as a, as a kind of sculptor or, or an artisan in this way, I think it's a positive metaphor 
than uh, than uh, thinking of just language alone. And uh, this is actually this artisanal idea, this idea of a, of a writer as an artisan, an academic writer, is one that that uh, Helen Sword um, has talked about in a book called Air and Light and Time and Space, How Successful Academics Write. What Helen Sword wanted to know was, or understand better, what uh, drives successful academics and how do successful academics Right, and and by successful successful academics, she means academics that produce um, uh, sufficiently in their own view. So, if you're an academic, do you publish in, in the volume that you feel is satisfactory to your to your to your field and to your needs? And do you have a good work life balance? And do you feel that you know, are you happy about um, about how much you write and how you write? And so successful academics, those that produce um, enough that they feel comfortable and happy with their writing, um, they, if she found that there were certain things that they had in common, certain attributes, certain habits, and we'll talk about these, these now. So she interviewed a hundred of these successful academic authors. And what she found was that among them, these habits stood out and she called this a base and uh, forming behavioral habits, artisanal habits, social habits, and emotional habits. And by behavioral habits, what uh, Helen Sword means is those habits which um, involve uh, if you set aside time for writing or how often you write. In other words, uh, what, uh, uh, what is your behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, your own writing? Do you do it every weekend? Do you uh, do you tend to have a special space for your writing, and so on? And uh, I'm going to give you a chance to look at this uh, and try making your analyzing yourself through a, a kind of questionnaire. Um, whether what what sort of habits you espouse of these? So she found that uh, Helen Swart found that these successful academics have particular behavioral habits that contribute contribute positively to their perception as being um, successful writers and the social habits are those related to um, do you write by yourself or do you write with others or do you show your writing to others do you socialize your writing the emotional habits are those related to um, uh, how do you feel about your own writing is it something that scares you or do you do you think that you're a good writer? And um, those are all sort of concrete ways, concrete uh, habits that uh, the the authors were able to, to talk about. But she also found uh, this artisanal um, habit. And by artisanal habits, Helen Sword was, is talking about more sort of metaphorically uh, to what extent do you, as an author, uh, see your writing as a kind of art that uh, you you take pride in, and that you want to constantly sculpt and and uh, mold and improve, and that you take that you take pride in. And so it's not just about <clears throat> if you set aside time for writing, or if you share your writing with others write with in the company of others or write um, uh, with others um, in other ways or if you feel good about your writing which are all things that she identified as being important but also uh, to what extent do you see your writing as a kind of craft <clears throat> and i hope that by the end at least by the end of this course you you have a, a better awareness of this that nobody is born an academic writer but you can hone your writing and and uh, shape it into the way you like. And one of the things that we'll be working on in this course is um, what are some shapes that writing can take of an academic article, a research article. What are what are some shapes that it can take? And so, if you have an idea of how it should shape up, then then you can you can hone your craft some more. Um, and uh, and hopefully, if you don't already. 
um, even take pride in, in what you in what you write. Because it is very common, and this is a barrier to to academic writing, is that um, all writers, um, including academic writers, can go through this kind of negative feedback loop of I'm not good enough, I can't write, I'm a failure, I should give up writing, they hate me, they, I guess in this case, being my peers. And, and then maybe procrastinate. Um, and that that big P word procrastinate is is uh, is uh, a death knell for academic writers because um, everybody feels pressured to write their research in a timely way, and um, if you find excuses not to, then then nobody ends up being happy. You it's a lose lose. You don't get your research out there, and the research world, your peers don't get to see your ideas. And so I want to talk about this for a moment, going back to uh, these these habits, these artisanal habits and um, emotional habits, especially now, because uh, even though kind of emotional habits can seem like something that isn't a, a practical uh, consideration when it comes to writing, in practice it actually is. Um, as Helen Sword notes in that book, The Air and Time, and space um, book, there these behavioral and artisanal and social and emotional habits form a kind of base, and this base uh, kind of uh, can look like the foundation of a house. And she calls this a writing house. Every every writer should build a writing house with more or less um, equal um, heights um, of in these pillars. And if one is much stronger or rather i should say if one is very small relative to the others then obviously your roof can just kind of crash in on your head and so um if this emotional pillar for example is is really really small then obviously the roof can tilt and cause problems and uh everybody's house can look different here you can have a stately home that perhaps the home of a a successful academic, maybe this one, or an academic who just likes to write uh, on her or his own. But the point is, is that you, in the beginning of your writing, academic writing career, your home, you may feel is kind of incomplete, you're still building it. And that's fine. Uh, but just be aware that the same kind of um, fear of rejection that you had when you got into your MA or PhD program, um, you're going to have it now as you head out into the academic publishing world with all the added pressures to publish. You need to be aware of these these base ideas, the behavioral, um, the artisanal, uh, the social, and uh, the emotional um, to that the, the social aspect of writing is actually one that we'll be walk, talking about in this course is very important as well to realize, to know that you are not alone, uh, that, that you are going through um, the, the same kind of challenges that not only inexperienced writers are going through, but also experienced ones. We, we are going through, I go through it now, um, even when I publish these days, this, the same kind of difficulties, maybe to, uh, for different reasons, at a different level, but uh, we all go through it, and it's important to to talk about um, these things and to have other people look at your writing as well. And solitude then is not a good thing; it's a barrier to to publication. Um, in addition to uh, these negative feelings that I, that I mentioned, uh, the self doubt, um, not only thinking all whether or not you're publishing in English or not doesn't matter. I think everybody in, in grad school goes through this self-doubt, wondering, is my research any good? Um, do I really know what I'm doing? Will anybody really care about what I write? And you add on to this the idea that um, you don't know if your academic peers will, will in, in uh, the people, your readers will, will like your ideas, and, and then add on top of that the idea that, oh, I'm a non-native speaker of English, which many, if not all of you are, um, can really uh, be a, a negative 
um, barrier to publication. So you have that. And, and then the added notion of, okay, uh, they're going to find me out. Uh, I'm an imposter. And this imposter syndrome is something that's it's, it's real. And it's something that's important to, to realize that we all go through this idea that uh, maybe, maybe I'm not, I'm going to be found out as a, not a real scientist or real academic. Um, and this is doubly the case if your first language is not English, because um, this imposterhood, in this case of a Burnett's talking about imposterhood as being feelings of inadequacy, personal inauthenticity or fraudulence, self-doubt, low self-efficacy beliefs, and sometimes generalized anxiety. This imposterhood is something that many, if not all, people in grad school go through. Um, but it's even stronger if your first language is not English because you may feel impost this imposterhood of, as an imposter of, uh, of, a, of in the English language. And so it's important uh, to, to talk about these things um, and be aware that, uh, that you're not the only one. And research will show that, research shows that simply discussing and realizing that you're not the only one feeling this way can help combat um, imposterhood. In fact, I'm going to ask you to look at a video about com com combating imposter syndrome um, because I think it's so, it is so worth, it's a very short video, it's less than five minutes, so it is really so worth thinking about. Um, in a book that I'll be referencing um, again, and you'll have some uh, readings from this book, just writing for publication. Uh, the authors Yolonko and Saracho um, illustrate uh, some of these negative feelings and, and how they can cause problems. And they, they cite um, lack of control and chaos and confusion, disorientation, feeling overwhelmed or swamped, and rambling, digressing, drifting, um, fear, worry, anxiety, turmoil, getting stuck, feeling helpless, all of these things, um, which can be exacerbated by the uh, imposter syndrome that I mentioned. All these things are very common uh, feelings for, for academic writers to, to have. And what's at the center of all this is this avoidance and procrastination and disappointment. And as I said, this big P word, procrastination, is a, is a real problem. And being aware of the foils, being aware of what can cause uh, this to happen is important. And uh, as and we've discussed some of these things uh, today. And it is important, therefore, to not think of the English language itself as being a barrier. Um, because if you do, then you, it's just one big negative uh, feeling that you'll have and another big reason to procrastinate. And uh, and if I haven't already, by the end of this course, I hope you see that that um, the English language per se, correctness alone, is not something that you need to think about as being a reason that you'll, that you'll be rejected. So what are we going to work on in this course? Well, um, as I talked about when I opened uh, this module, we want to work on your voice, not just grammar and vocabulary, but um, how can you make your voice stand out uh, in your paper in a clear, um, convincing way? We're going to look beyond um, surface issues of language and look at the bigger picture. Because when one writes, an experienced author writes, a successful author, it's, it's kind of like this image here in a car. Here you have to imagine that you're inside a car and you're looking at the, head, the road ahead of you. At the same time, you have to have an awareness of what's in the road behind you in the rear view mirror. And when I write, um, this is what I do. Um, and I'm able to do this um, obviously when I drive, but when I write as well um, throughout the writing process, which is looking, I'm thinking about what I'm, where I'm going with my discourse, where I'm going with my writing, but I'm also looking at where I've already taken the reader. 
what the reader also already knows, what I've stated clearly, the path that I've led the reader down already. And this is happening simultaneously as I write. And what happens um, for non-native speakers is they tend to look only at not just not even the road ahead, but just the road right under their wheels, um, because they're focusing so much on getting the language right. And this is a barrier because um, this guiding the reader, this that was a feature of good writing, um, as Sullivan pointed out and I mentioned earlier, helping the reader follow your train of thought, that is made much more difficult if you're not looking at this road ahead or looking at the road right immediately behind you um, or the path that you've already led the reader down. And so in this course, we'll also be looking at what is this path, um, the, the bigger picture, how, where should you be um, leading the reader to? And so you'll have a better notion, I hope, by the end of this course of what of this road so that you you have an awareness of it and, and not just focus on the road immediately beneath your feet or your wheels. We're also going to uh, help train you guys to to be uh, your own language detectives. Um, this course, I would love to be with you guys for the rest of your lives and, and be, you know, uh, your personal consultant, your personal uh, academic uh, writing trainer, but I know that uh, I, I hope that uh, you won't need me. Uh, that's the, the the irony of a teacher is that they, the teacher hopes that they won't be needed anymore. Um, they want to to make they want to be unemployed by you. Uh, and so what I hope is that by the end of this course you can autonomously um, help yourselves uh, through various tools and strategies that we'll be talking about, and one of which is becoming a language detective, how to find uh, solutions to linguistic problems that you'll encounter um, along your, your academic writing life. So our objectives here are more to do with, uh, they are language related, but they're more to do with things like uh, how to tell your research story, the tools that you need to, to get your uh, to help yourself in your writing. Um, how to be aware of your audience and the importance of that and what the audience expects. And um, and for you to ultimately have more confidence in your writing. We really hope that by the end of this course, you feel more confident that when you sit down in front of your computer or whatever, uh, you feel like, okay, I think I know what I need to do. Uh, this is a, a course that is obviously it has a language focus component in it, but uh, I want to move beyond English and think about your development as a writer, as a, as a kind of work in progress, uh, that you're forming your own identity as, as, a, as an academic author and I hope to make a, contrib a positive contribution to the formation of this identity. Um, by the end of this course, yes, we want to be able to to help you write an academic ar article or, or publish, but broad, more broadly, that you'll learn to tell a, a research story because at the end of the day, that's what a good uh, academic writer does. A good academic writer is telling uh, a research story, hopefully not telling a, a whopper, <laughs> a, one of those stories about the one that got away, the, the fisherman's story, but telling a, a research story, a story uh, that has a, per, a particular structure that your readership will be accustomed to uh, and, uh, and, and tell it in an engaging way. And so the, the focus of this course is, is not just uh, about how to do something, uh, particular formula or uh, recipes, but um, hopefully getting you to feel comfortable as a as a as a an artisan of your own craft that you will hone for your own particular discipline, and ultimately uh, that you will feel that you have a better chance of acceptance, not just of a particular paper, um, but of your ideas 
and increasing your chances of having your voice heard. heard. Um, so the outline of the course is basically this. We've covered the, uh, the introduction to, uh, in this module. In the next module, we'll be looking at um, some particular elements of language, including how to solve linguistic problems on your own. Uh, in the third module, how to look ahead strategically to your writing, um, planning it in advance. It's important to think about, think to think before you write. Module four is about what I call orienting the reader, which is already already signaling to the reader what the importance is of what you have to say, and um, and and shining a light on. Uh, what the contribution is of your research. Uh, the fifth module is getting down to the nitty gritty of writing your introduction, the introduction section of your of your article. Uh, then in the sixth module, we'll be talking more about uh, how to make your writing clearer and make your voice stand out as an author. These are things that are important and often can be criticized by reviewers if they're not uh, done well. Module seven will look at some important elements uh, that can be uh, key to writing a good method section. Modules eight and nine spend a good amount of time uh, on uh, discussing your results and and concluding how to how to do that because that again, and along with the introduction section, can be a very tricky section for authors. Um, and then the last module is talking something it's beyond writing, really. It's about um, how to deal with publishers, how to deal with uh, responding to reviewers and other other uh, related matters, not not uh, developing a text per se, but other um, matters to do with the academic publishing process. So uh, that's that's our our course in a nutshell. Um, and uh, throughout, throughout all this, um, it is helpful if you have your own data uh, that, you've, that, you, that you've already collected because uh, this can make things much more concrete for you as you write for this course, thinking about uh, your own data and how that will drive uh, your article. Uh, by the end of the course, what I hope to have, or hope that you will have, is a kind of template uh, that you will kind of develop um, along this course. Not a fully fleshed article, but uh, a kind of template of, uh, with some parts that are more fleshed out than others that you'll be able to, to use later on as a blueprint for, for future articles that you write. So the idea is that you'll have this template, you'll have gone through a kind of experience of writing in this course, and then later on when you do finalize an article and you write future articles, you can go back to this experience and remember um, and help you develop uh, further on. Uh, the way you'll be, oops, the way you'll be assessed in this course is um, through a number of activities and tasks and kind of quizzes uh, that you'll be taking now, um, and also what I call peer activities. And basically, as I mentioned in in this module, I see this as a very important thing that you you go through the process of not looking only at your own writing, but the writing of others, and you see writing more as a not just a solitary process, but a social process. Not because I'm a, I want to be mean and force you to do that for this course, but because I'd like you to have this habit, simply because it, it shows, research shows that this can make, an, as for example, the Helen Sword research that I cited earlier, uh, can make a positive contribution to your success um, as a writer, um, reducing the negative feelings involved, but also um, helping you in the process of honing your manuscript, uh, improving your writing. And then um, a big assignment for this course will be actually writing a full introduction section. And I, I'll talk about this some more uh, in the later modules. But 
in case you're wondering why the introduction section alone and why that is particularly has such a great weight uh, relative to other sections that we focus on in this course is that uh, essentially it's your your first impression uh, it, it, a, a good introduction section can make or break a manuscript is also the section that uh, most EAL English as an additional language authors report as having uh, trouble with and so if I could if with the time that we have for this class if I can focus on one particular section and help you improve in that section it's the introduction section but it's not the only one uh, the final article uh, if you have a full article by the end of the course that's great if not, then you might you will have probably um, a patchwork and bits and pieces of an article that you will finally submit as your final as your as your final assessment uh, for this for this class. In addition to a kind of reflection that I'll be talking about um, later. And so um, that that's it uh, for this course. As I said before, um, I'm really really excited about this course. And I really hope that you find this uh, very useful and helpful, not just now uh, for your immediate purposes, but also uh, long term in the future. Thank you for choosing this course, and uh, I look forward to, to seeing your writing.